Chapter 29 of A Treasury of Heroes and Heroines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Treasury of Heroes and Heroines by Clayton Edwards. Chapter 29 Edith Cavill. As the name of Florence Nightingale became world-famous at the close of the Crimean War more than sixty years ago, the name of another English nurse who suffered martyrdom in the World War will go down into history with the luster of glory and self-sacrifice surrounding it. That name is Edith Cavill. Edith Cavill was born at Swartiston in Norwich, England in 1873. Her father was an English minister of the old school who was rector of a single parish in Norwich for more than half a century. Edith and her sister were brought up in strict conformance with church ideas, and were taught the value of leading useful lives and the glory of self-sacrifice. As was customary at the time when she was a young girl, she received her education on the continent, attending school in the city of Brussels in Belgium. She then returned to her home and remained there until— when twenty-one years old and resolved to give her life to some useful and benevolent occupation, she decided to become a trained nurse and went to London to study that calling. She studied at the London Hospital, a place, we are told, where the hardest and most difficult conditions prevailed, and where the nurses were worked to the limit of their strength. She also held the position of a nurse in two other hospitals, the Shoreditch Infirmary in Hoxton and the St. Pancras Infirmary and she gained a reputation both for hard work and efficiency, while her patients often spoke of her gentleness and her kindness. Not content with forgetting a patient when discharged from the hospital, Edith Cavill often followed him to his home and continued there the lighter nursing that would assure his convalescence. Her regular duties were severe enough, but she used a large part of her scanty leisure for such purposes as these. In 1906, Edith Cavill left the English hospitals where she had made a reputation for herself, and went back to Brussels where she took a position as matron in a medical and surgical home. Nursing in Brussels had been conducted hitherto by Roman Catholic Sisters of Mercy, and at first they were inclined to look upon Miss Cavill as an untrained outsider, but her tact, efficiency, and skill soon won the hearts of these good women. Who afforded her every courtesy and entered into cordial cooperation with her. Her home succeeded so well that three years after its commencement, Miss Cavill started also a training school for nurses. She was popular everywhere in the Belgian capital, and although Protestant, she gained the praise of the Roman Catholic priests for the generous and unselfish work that she performed. When the war broke out, Miss Cavill was on a vacation with her mother. Every year she returned twice to England to visit her family. Her father had died by this time, but her mother was close to her heart, and she saw her as often as she could. "'I may be looked on as an old maid,' she is reported as saying, "'but with my work and my mother I am a very happy one, and desire nothing more as long as I have these two. When war was declared, Miss Cavill lost no time in hurrying back to Brussels, believing that her duty called her there. She wrote a letter commenting on the German army when it swept through Belgium and in it she voiced her pity for the tired, footsore German soldiers, who were later to slay her. Brussels became a part of the German Empire, and a tyrannical governor came there to establish his headquarters, issuing proclamations threatening the Belgians with death for minor offenses, and filling Brussels with spies and intrigue. Miss Cavill desired to continue her hospital work, and went to the governor, von Bissing, to get permission to do so. He granted it, for the quiet English nurse made an impression upon him. We are told that the arrogant German formed a high opinion of her, so much so that he secretly determined to keep her under the strictest supervision. From that time on spies dogged her tracks. She cared for the wounded German soldiers and nursed a number of German officers as well as the Belgians who were in her care. But this made no difference to the authorities. They were determined to detect her in some crime and punish her. It was not fitting, they thought, that an enemy should be engaged in works of mercy, even though they themselves might benefit thereby. And soon spies began to come to the governor with tales and fabrications of the crimes that she had been committing in their eyes. They bore witness that she had given an overcoat to a Frenchman who was cold and hungry, and the Frenchman later escaped over the Dutch frontier. 
Once she gave a glass of water to a Belgian soldier. She had given money to poor people, perhaps to soldiers. But the main reason that the Germans hated her was because she was held in great affection by the people of Brussels. On the night of August 5, 1915, we are told, Miss Cavell was tying up the wounds of a wounded German soldier when a group of armed men entered the room and their leader told her roughly that she was under arrest. A blow was the only response when she tried to expostulate. She was taken to prison and placed in solitary confinement. Her arrest was shrouded with the most careful secrecy, for the Germans did not want to have the representatives of neutral governments, such as the United States, know of the affair or of what they proposed to do. But word of her plight did reach England through a traveler, and at once the British government requested the American ambassador, Dr. Page, to get what information he could from Brand Whitlock, the American minister in Belgium. He went at once to the German authorities, but they evaded his questions and waited ten days before giving him a reply. Then the Germans sent him a statement, declaring that Edith Cavell herself had admitted to giving money to English and Belgian soldiers, and furnishing them with guides to help them to the Dutch frontier, whence they might escape into Holland and return to England. This was the German statement. If what they said were true, there was still no cause for killing the unfortunate woman in their power, for she was not accused at any time of having been a spy. But they had planned to try her for her life, and Mr. Whitlock soon guessed this, in spite of the fact that the Germans kept their preparations from him so far as possible. An American lawyer, Mr. De Level, was requested by Mr. Whitlock to take Miss Cavell's case and do whatever was possible in her behalf. He was not allowed to see the prisoner, and was not even allowed to look at the documents in the case until the trial began. Another lawyer, who was a Belgian, suddenly appeared and told the Americans that there was not the least cause for them to worry, as Miss Cavell was sure to receive only just treatment. He also promised to let them know when the trial was to take place, and that he would keep them informed of all the developments in the case. All these promises were broken. It is true that he sent a note a few days before the trial telling Mr. Whitlock that the case was about to come to court, but that is all he told them. He never informed them that the death sentence had been imposed, he never came to see them afterward, and when they sought him for an explanation and for assistance, he had disappeared. Miss Cavell was kept in solitary confinement for two months, and then was tried with a number of other persons who were accused of crimes against the German government. It was only from a private source that Mr. de Level learned that the trial was under way, and that the death sentence had been given. Miss Cavell herself, we are told, was calm, dignified, and brave at the trial, and faced her accusers heroically. She was dressed in her nurse's uniform and wore the badge of the Red Cross. When Mr. Whitlock learned that she had been tried and sentenced to death, he did everything possible to secure her pardon, or at least a moderation of the punishment. He wrote to Baron von der Lunken, pointing out in a clear and decisive manner that Miss Cavell had served the Germans by caring for their wounded and that the death sentence had never before been inflicted for the crime of which she was accused. He also wrote a note to the Baron, which is as follows. My dear Baron, I am too ill to present my request to you in person, but I appeal to your generosity of heart to support it and save this unfortunate woman from death. Have pity on her. Brand Whitlock. All through the day the American legation sent message after message to the German authorities asking for information. They received none. At 6.20 in the evening they were told by a subordinate that the sentence had not been given, only to learn later that it had indeed been declared, and that Miss Cavell would face a firing squad at two o'clock the following morning. Mr. Whitlock then urged Baron von der Lanken to appeal to General von Bissing to mitigate the sentence and at eleven in the evening he was told that von Bissing refused to do anything to save Miss Cavell's life. At the same time that the governor denied this appeal, Edith Cavell was allowed to see a British chaplain. She told him that she was not in the least afraid of death, and willingly gave her life for her country. Her words resembled those of Florence Nightingale that have been quoted elsewhere in this book. Death, she said, was well known to her, and she had seen it so often that it was not strange or fearful to her. 
Early in the morning, with her eyes bandaged, Miss Cavill was led out to face the rifles of the Huns. She wore an English flag over her bosom. Only Germans were witnesses of the execution, but the German chaplain who attended said that she died like a heroine. When her death became known, the entire civilized world was shocked and horrified. In England, this murder did more to stimulate recruiting than anything else up to that time. All day long, lines of men waited to sign the papers of enlistment, and in Miss Cavill's hometown, every eligible man was sworn into the army. A bitter denunciation of the German act was made by Sir Edward Grey. The Germans themselves had only a poor excuse for what they had done. In brief, the case against the German authorities is as follows. They had not previously inflicted the death penalty for the offense of which Miss Cavill was accused. They had kept her in solitary confinement and prevented her from consulting an advocate up to the time of her trial. She was tried with great haste and with great secrecy, and after the trial the sentence was carried out far more speedily than usual. Moreover, they had deceived Mr. Whitlock and the other members of the American legation and had done so deliberately. After the execution, they refused to return the body. But the name of Edith Cavill has become one of the world's great names, and her fame grows brighter as time passes. In the hospital where she was in training for her high calling, a fitting memorial to her is being prepared. It is the Edith Cavill home, to be a permanent part of the London hospital where she served her difficult apprenticeship. But her chief memorial is in the hearts and minds of the British nation. End of chapter 29 Recording by Tamara Schwartz, Newburgh, Oregon